Okay, I think we are going here. John Wood, uh, Director of Media Development at Better Angels. Uh, welcome to the Glenn Show, John. This is Glenn Lowry, Brown University, uh, Watson uh, Institute for International Public Affairs and Professor of Economics. The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. I'm with John Wood, uh, Director of Media Development, Better Angels. Uh, my uh, previous guest here on a number of occasions at the Glenn Show, uh, Better Angels is out there trying to deal with the extreme uh, divisive partisanship that has emerged and encourage uh, red Americans and blue Americans, so to speak, to talk to each other and not to, not to fall completely out of fellowship as uh, members of the same national enterprise. I hope I get that more or less right. And John is the spearhead of that effort. Uh, so uh, again, welcome, John. Great, uh, great to be black. Uh, I think I said great to be black. That too. But great, to be, <laughs> great to be back, Glenn, and great, great to be great to be back uh, back with you. Back and black with you, I guess. I don't know, but yeah, I'm feeling good. Well, how's it going uh, out there as the uh, election of 2020 fast approaches? I'm not sure the country's going to survive it. Yeah. Well, look. Um, certainly, recognition of the fact that. Political polarization, and just broadly speaking, I mean, the fracturing of any sort of cohesive sense that across the political and ideological and even sort of cultural and ethnic spectrum, we are people who are, as Americans, committed to a common enterprise uh, that is serviced by a shared culture of, of civic engagement and democratic spirit. There's a broad, I think, there's increasingly a broad recognition of the fact that this is a problem. But I think that the phase of the larger conversation we may be entering into is whether or not this is a core problem that must be met on its own terms or whether or not this polarization is the expression of a larger problem. That is to say, if you're on the right, the fault of folks on the left tearing the country apart, or if you're on the left, the fault of Donald Trump and folks on the right tearing, tearing the country apart, that needs to be met in terms of all-out partisan warfare that needs to be accomplished in order to ultimately bring the country back together in the aftermath of the destruction of the opposition, so as to ultimately sort of, you know, heal the nation from the wounds of division by casting out the dividers, uh, if, if you will. Um, but I think that on either side of that view of the problem of polarization, there is nevertheless a recognition of the fact that the division is a problem. Question is, is you know, is this a is this a problem to be solved uh, with uh, with water or fire, so to speak? And um, you know, so I'm uh, Better Angels obviously represents an approach to this issue that focuses on reestablishing the idea that there are common bonds that bind us as Americans that transcend the left-right divide, that transcend the cultural and ethnic divide, and that there are principles we can act upon to stabilize that culture <clears throat> and to sort of reforge the bonds in a way that can withstand the divisive pull of the ideological extremes, even in the face of terrible problems and deeply embedded social conflict. And so that's, that's our approach, and that's the approach that uh, helped us win the day. Well, okay. Let me see if I understand you. Mm. There is a raging uh, war or battle going on between factions. Right. Uh, and that's the nature of our situation, and there are reasons for that, and we could go into that. But we ought to not uh, allow ourselves to uh, slide into a way of carrying out that argument that is just destructive. We ought to find ways of being able to disagree with each other without rending the political social fabric to an irreparable degree. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that, that's what you guys are about. Uh, do I get that right? Yes, that is, that is certainly correct. Well, because I want to ask a question. If the president of the United States is a traitor, Talking about the guy duly elected by the Electoral College and installed as president is, in fact, under the control of a foreign power. Mm. If indeed Deutsche Bank did make loans to him that were backed up by Russian uh, mm. oligarchs, et cetera, et cetera. Right. 
Okay, if he collaborated with a hostile foreign power to undermine the integrity of the democratic process. Mm. Okay, so that's one scenario. The other scenario is if the deep state operatives, the James Clappers and the John Brennans and the James Comeys of the world Mm -hmm. actually did willfully try to subvert the outcome of a democratic process that put a populist demagogue, I don't mean that pejoratively, into the Oval Office. They thought better of the process than the American people thought. Mm-hmm. And they sought to use their power surreptitiously and to some degree illegally to undermine if they indeed did try to affect a coup d'etat, mm-hmm. John, okay? So right. on the one side, you got a president who's a traitor. Mm-hmm. On the other side, you've got surreptitious deep state coup d'etat, I, I don't understand why those are not following my sword, <laughs> cut the other guy's throat, fight it to the bitter end issues. I don't know what difference I'm splitting. I mean, if either one of those scenarios is true, I don't get where moderation is a virtue. Mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and in general, you, you come up against those types of those <laughs> polarities and uh, throat slitting is exactly what you get. You know, because, you know, it's, it's just as bad as you say it is. It really is in terms of the, the, the power of those narratives and the fact that, you know, one or maybe even both of them are true. You know, maybe neither of them are true, but it's possible that both of them are true in some substantial, some substantial way. But here's the thing. Now, I believe in the idea that unity is something to be striven for. I believe that while also believing that perfect unity is an impossible thing to summon, ultimately. You, without giving up on anybody, I simultaneously hold the contradictory sort of conviction or at least, you know, belief or suspicion that some people will always be unavailable to a way of viewing our political and social situation, which puts, p- puts imperative priority on sustaining the sort of central bonds of society for the sake of facilitating a prosperous future for our children. Um, some people will never prioritize that among winning a shorter term uh, political battle uh, motivated by the need to avenge their own bitter disappointments and wounds and injuries against their opposition because that's just a deep part of human nature right there. And these are two competing aspects of human human nature and social and psychological motivation that are going to find themselves in tension, that already do, and will find themselves, I believe, more and more in tension over the course of not just the 2020 election, but likely whatever comes out of it. So anybody who is, or at least many, many people, maybe the majority of people, who might sign up for our project, for Better Angels, what it is we're trying to do, has to come on board with this, with the understanding that we are trying to work on the long term, on solidifying the the enduring foundation of American democracy, of our democratic republic, Uh, taking on board the fact that it is going to require us to not abandon our political positions as Democrats or Republicans or what have you, but to accept the fact that there are going to be political outcomes which are likely going to be disappointing to one side or the other, but that the reward of holding together as a nation at the core of our society and abiding by certain interpersonal and intergroup virtues that sustain our relationships, the reward of the reward that comes from that is going to be having a country that continues to work and do the job of providing a foundation of prosperity and liberty for ourselves and for our children going forward. The reward for retreating from that is the possibility that you might do some substantial damage to your political opposition, but that will fundamentally undermine the American project in the meantime. And so the irony of what I'm saying is that in a sense, In the work of depolarization, I'm insisting that on a certain level, we'd be willing to draw a line ourselves in saying that, look, we want to bring all Americans together. We know that at a certain point, 
it's going to be too much for, for some folks. Some folks are going to have a difficult time crossing the line towards holding hands with the Trump supporter if you're, you know, a social justice activist or if you're, a, you know, if you're, if you're firm in your support for Trump, you may never see any dignity in a person wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, right? And we're always going to hold the olive branch out for folks to bring them into the, bring them into the heart of the American family. But somebody's got to hold this space in the middle. And I don't mean middle in terms of political moderate. I mean middle in terms of people who prioritize the integrity of democratic relationship for its own sake. Somebody has to hold that to keep the ship afloat while these other wings of the political conversation um, are, are going, going to war with each other and to create a centripetal force in the middle of that that's able to sustain the integrity of okay. a Republican society. And so that's the way uh, I, I, I've, I've listened to you, man, and I'm unconvinced. I'm, I'm very much unconvinced. I mean, it sounds all very good, but I think mm-hmm. so uh, process and, and substance you might object to this distinction. Process is how we talk to each other and resolve our disputes, and substance is the fact of the dispute itself. Mm. And we could give a ton of examples. Um, now, you must be, by focusing on process, as I understand you, implicitly assuming that the substantive questions are not of such a nature uh, as to require that a side be chosen uh, and its imperatives acted upon. I mean, what do I mean? What I mean is the country had a civil war, as I'm sure you are aware. Mm. I don't think it gets any more divisive than hundreds of thousands of bodies strewn across Antietam and et cetera, Gettysburg and so forth. I mean, the country had a vicious, violent conflagration Mm. leading up to it. I can hear your speech. Mm. And if I knew enough history, I'd be able to cite chapter and verse about who gave it. The speech being, let us not allow these differences over the institution of slavery to tear the republic asunder. Maybe Abraham Lincoln says something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we get to just finish my point. My point is that when the proverbial SHIT hit the fan, Mm -hmm. a war had to take place before the issue was resolved. And Mm -hmm. talk about process would have been severely out of place in that context, it seems to me, and I don't know whether you would agree with that or not, but my point is, in order to focus on process such as you're doing, you must have already reached, if not consciously, then implicitly this, the conclusion that the, the various substantive issues that are at play that cause the partisan division are not of such a nature that uh, moral consistency requires that one make a choice mm. as between them. Mm. Comment. Uh, I want to uh, make sure I understand your original distinction. So you said that process relates to um, the ways that we engage each other in a person. Yeah. You had, a, you had, a, you had a, uh, another category. Well, side. that was, I said substance, but I don't mean it to be a put down to say, oh, you're just process and this is substance. Oh, yeah. but, the, but the substance was that they're arguing about something. They're arguing okay. about in the case at hand, whether or not Donald Trump is a traitor or whether or not uh, the deep state sought to, sought to subvert an election. But that's just one example. Right. And arguments along many dimensions along the racial front. And I know uh, you have a lot to say about that. And I want to hear about it. Mm-hmm. How we can uh, bridge the gap between white supremacists on the one hand and uh, Black Lives Matter advocates uh, who some people see as uh, hating cops and loving thugs on mm-hmm. the other on the other end. Uh, we got a lot of substantive issues mm-hmm. that, that we're arguing about. But in order to, I'm saying, in order to make the central focus of your activities on encouraging Americans across the partisan divide to get along, which I'm calling process, mm-hmm. one has already to have reached at least implicitly the conclusion okay. that whether one or the other side is right is not the biggest deal in the world, as it was with respect to slavery. It was mm-hmm. such a big deal that we put massive armies uh, in place in order to, by brunt of military force, uh, resolve the dispute. Right. Can process stand apart from substance, ultimately? You know, uh, that is... Well, so same- when, when you make process stand apart, you're implicitly assuming something about substance. That, that's right. my point. My, my point is you're implicitly assuming there's not a right and a wrong side such that you have to take a stand. Mm-hmm. Except for the fact that 
we seek to facilitate structures in the democratic process that allow for us to go to bat with one another on these political issues in a way that sacrifices none of the vigor of our passionate, subjective disposition with respect to these substantive issues, Glenn. So the very brilliance of the constitutional system is that it is a framework whereby in a controlled and constructive way, we can bring in our subjective dispositions towards the most radically sort of polarizing issues, or at least a wide, wide range of them, and find a way to hammer it out to the point to where we can arrive at some kind of a constructive consensus around these things that allows us to move forward in the context of the democratic process. Okay, let me ask you a question. I'm I'm listening to you. Let me ask you a question. Suppose Trump wins in November 2020. Right. Will you, on behalf of the objectives of Better Angels, encourage the resistance to subside? Say, in effect, the democratic process has made this man our president, our president, mm-hmm. and talk about him as, uh, uh, you know, uh, not our president, not legitimate, impeach 45 and all of that is mm-hmm. out of place because twice the people have spoken. Will you do that? In the mm-hmm. interest, in the interest of protecting the institutions, will you tell Stacey Abrams to concede an election that she lost? Mm-hmm. In the interest of protecting the institutions, will you tell the New York Times to stop editorializing in the news section Mm. and to climb down off of their high horse? I'm serious about this. Now, people are going to get mad at me because they think I'm defending Trump. I'm not. Mm. I'm defending the very institutions that you say are essential Mm -hmm. to allowing us to resolve our disputes in a peaceable manner. They're under assault, John. Okay? And Mm -hmm. it's it's a time for people to take a stand. So I'm asking you whether or not the interest of promoting uh, uh, comity across the partisan divides has room for protecting essential institutions of the United States, of our governance, from Mm -hmm. uh, being destroyed in a partisan frenzy. And if if I needed to find some examples on the right, I could find them. His name is Mitch McConnell. (laughs) Okay, I, it's not as if this is only on the left okay, that, I, that, that I'm concerned Moscow about. Mitch, as they're, they're calling him these days. Well, yeah. I wouldn't call him Moscow <laughs> Mitch because, you know. But, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm but not saying that's what people are saying. You know, that's, the, that's the point, though. That's the, you know, the names being thrown out. Uh, there are three levels of response to what, to what, you've, what you've said, keeping in mind that I am an individual. I am an individual speaking within and to a certain degree for Better Angels, but that Better Angels is an organization that sure. represents many other, many other people. On the individual level, I might very well say things along the lines of what you were saying. And just like anybody else, whether leader or member within Better Angels, I am at liberty to articulate my subjective political posture, even as I am committed to providing a structure and a framework for people to both achieve a deeper sense of understanding in terms of where the other side is coming from, but to also channel our subjective disagreements into a constructive process to augment the larger constructive process that is our constitutional system. So that's the individual level. Um, As an organization, uh, Better Angels is not likely, I think, on a national level to issue such a statement. But Better Angels is composed of regional um, and state level and um, county level alliances, which uh, any and all of our members have the opportunity to participate in. And within our sort of federalized or decentralized sort of setup, um, it is quite possible that our local Better Angels alliances will be able to issue statements of such a nature as might reflect a bipartisan consensus within the group. And that bipartisan consensus locally could appear to be well to the left or well to the right, well to the right on a national sort of spectrum. And so I, I hope that that answer fleshes out for you a little bit kind of the nature of what it is we're attempting here, because it's not just about comedy. That is sort of a core ingredient. Uh, you know, this, this value that this, this term that I coined that we use called patriotic empathy, this idea that we demonstrate our love of country by the care that we take for one another, it's at the root of, you know, the the essence of civic relationship that should make a sophisticated sort of deliberative process possible. But that deliberative process still needs to allow for some 
nearly radical emotional expression, or at least some powerful subjective expression to assert itself in the context of the process of, of arriving, at, arriving at consensus. And we fully expect it to be messy, even within better angels. But we're seeking to provide outlets for this that contribute to the solidifying of our civic culture and not the upending of it, right? And so that's the tightrope that we have to walk and that we've been walking one way or another in the United States, I think, forever, obviously with much greater and much lesser degrees of success at various points. But that's what we're committed to. Give, give me an example, a concrete example of something that you think uh, the Better Angels activity has been very successful um, on the ground in, uh, you know, tamping down conflict or facilitating a, a, a mutually respectful uh, and constructive exchange across partisan divides? Well, I think that our success to date has been in forging relationships across these divides that are just beginning to sort of uh, sprout in terms of growing bipartisan structures on top of them which may be able to accommodate some of these more severe social collisions in a way that can demonstrate a, a, a real sort of sort of uh, um, ameliorating effect on issues in a local in a local community or in a, in a particular state or region so we have about seven thousand members nationally we've had activities in you know, we've got members in all 50 states, activities in about 34 of them, and alliances in probably about 18 or 20 of them. And Did out you of say 70,000 or 7,000? I'm sorry. 7,000, about 7,500. Uh-huh. 7,500, 7, okay, thank you. Yeah. So in a, now, a lot of things are changing within Better Angels, and, and a lot of effort is going into understanding how we can be a – a forcefully constructive uh, presence in the 2020 election. So I hope to come back to you in a year's time and have much more to say on the subject of, look, this is what was going on in South Lebanon, Ohio, or in Los Angeles, California. And this is how our community was able to impact a given situation in the midst of a great deal of fr- friction. But the, but the fact of the matter is, is this is the test that we are just coming up against now. So we've reached a certain level of, organizational maturity to where we have we have we have a thin national infrastructure right we certainly have received a lot of commendation in the press and from academics and journalists and so forth and we have a diverse membership and many formidable people who are leading the organization but what it is we're seeking to do is unprecedented and so you're right to be skeptical because this has not been proven to be an approach existing in the private um, and volunteer arena um, that can that can tackle an, uh, what is an unprecedented, in many respects, political situation, because all of this is new. Both what we are doing is new and much of what we are responding to is new. So it, it's, it is a creative it is a creative enterprise. And I think the question you ask is the right question. But I think it will be a fairer question, if I may beg off as in political style for a moment. I think it will be an even fairer question, um, you know, about a little more than a year from now, after the 2020 election. I should okay, say. You're, you're fostering the development of relationships across the divides that will bear fruit in the fullness of time. So, okay, that's fair. Uh, you know, I happen to see uh, a speech that you gave out at Aspen. Yeah. Uh, you're standing in the middle of a round. It was a theater in the round kind of setting. I've never actually given a speech where I've had a 360 yeah. audience, and you're you're just there, bare man. There's no protection. There's not even a podium. It's just you. It's weird. This, this is like Dave Chappelle or something like that. I don't know how a person pulls that off. No, I'm not kidding, audience. I yeah. I recommend that you consider trying it. So just stand up in front of a group of people. <laughs> just you and the microphone, man. That that's yeah. that's a daunting challenge. But I thought you pulled it off pretty well. Well. You were talking about race mm-hmm. and the racial divide, and, and you were so passionate. In it. Do you want to reprise some of the concerns that you were, uh, you know, trying to give voice to in that setting? Sure, sure, right. So I was um, speaking to the uh, weave the social fabric 
uh, Project Conference, which is an initiative of the Aspen Institute headed by David Brooks, journalist, obviously, New York Times. Yeah. And um, the the goal of uh, the Weave the Social Fabric Project, um, with a fair amount of overlap with what we do at Better Angels, though not quite the same same points of emphasis, uh, is to essentially identify and to uplift the work of people who are, quote, weaving community, unquote, um, in their areas of social enterprise, and to bring these people together in a way that networks their efforts and scales up potentially a larger culture. I'm at a school here. You may hear the bell ringing. Okay. That scales up a larger culture of not just intergroup empathy, but intergroup social collaboration that can counteract the plague of loneliness and social dissolution in our society and that also trans and that also may transcend the political divides as well and so it was an it was an interesting event because there was a great deal, deal of diversity in the room and I don't just mean racial or ethnic diversity but you had folks in the room who were most of, a lot of the folks in the room were sort of you know, institutional kind of, you know, uh, liberal individuals from the, from the philanthropic sector. Yeah. Um, you had some, you had some Republicans who were connected probably with think tanks and, and some sophisticated uh, academic or media organizations. Uh, you had a smattering of Trump supporters and, you know, evangelical folks and then you had a strong contingency of not only people of color, but people of a very deep-seated social justice uh, orientation. And I think that, first of all, the whole conference was wonderful and noble and did a lot of good. I think that the essential difficulty in some of it was the fact that some folks came into this meeting not quite perfectly aligned on sort of first principles in terms of whether or not we should really be coming together in the first place, sort of owing to the type of uh, analogy you drew. Not everybody was necessarily convinced of the idea that as nice as it sounded to come together over some common values, might it not be more important for me to take a stand for justice, however I see justice, to take yeah. a stand for, you know, asserting the fact that some people in this room are more privileged than others, and we need to acknowledge that before we can make progress on any type of a larger collaborative cultural shift. You know, how did you feel about that? I'm sorry to interrupt, but how did you feel about that comment right there? The comment that I just made? Yeah, um, um, you, you know, put words in the mouth of somebody who was there, who was taking a certain social justice perspective. Yeah. And, and demanding of the audience that uh, they need to come right now in this room to terms with the fact that some of the people participating in this conversation mm -hmm. are privileged. What I'm asking you is whether or not that move is consistent with the objectives of promoting uh, comedy and uh, useful mm -hmm. and constructive conversation across lines. Because it just defined somebody as privileged. Mm. Uh, it just made a move, didn't it? Did, didn't it just uh, pull a card? Right. Yeah. Well, you know. Did it not I, pull I, rank? Did it not assume something kind of morally high-handed? Mm, mm. You're white. Yeah. You grew up in a suburb. You went to a good school. You got a brown education and you make $180,000 a year. So you're privileged. And therefore, we have to acknowledge your privilege before we can go further. No, I'm so not playing the devil's advocate. Yeah, 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 yeah. But do you see what I'm trying to get at? I can take you I'm back to the original can, question that I was asking about can, process and substance. Yeah. yeah, I can take it head on. I mean, for the sake of argument, I don't have to I don't have to make a judgment as to whether or not that person may not be saying something uh, politically or socially, historically, or maybe even morally valid, uh, while at the same time being I don't have to make a judgment either way with respect to that and yet still be able to, to recognize the fact that that is a tremendous obstacle uh, towards a functioning communication, okay. right? Towards building relationships. If that's the way she feels, these, we had better take that into account. Across these, across these boundaries. Um, no, it's, it's, it's an obstacle, certainly. Um, but my, my uh, task at that point, and in the context of that speech that you saw me give, is to be able to set up the sort of philosophical kind of architecture whereby we can see that we can have these radically different starting points and yet find our way to sort of a, a means of both understanding one another, 
communicating with one another, and then a step beyond that, working with one another. Okay, so um, sketch that, 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 uh, that architecture. Right. And so essentially, and, and, and so, you know, the, the, the way I went about giving that speech was I, I have the luxury of being able to draw on a personal biography wherein, you know, I have members of my family, who you know, Glenn, who are distributed across the racial and political spectrum and economic yeah. spectrum way out to sort of its edges in many, many directions. So I was able to draw from that and making the point that it is possible for us to, to love and work together with each other beyond even these seemingly intractable impasses. But, Can I give the audience your signature line? Your signature line yeah. is that you're, you have a white conservative father and you have a black uh, uh, left-wing mother and you spend <laughs> much of your childhood explaining one parent to the other. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's it in a, in, a, in a nutshell. Although, interestingly, um, it was really my black conservative uncle and my white progressive aunt who are most <laughs> ideologically entrenched on either side of that. <laughs> my mom and my dad, because they raised me day to day, but it was my Reagan loving uncle and my, you know. Who's black? Who's, who's black? Who's black, right. And, <laughs> my, you know, uh, Obama loving aunt, who were really kind of the ones who would okay. represent the polls. So it's in your and, very DNA, bridging these divides. Is that, is that <laughs> what we're supposed to understand? Well, uh, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. Uh, I guess I'm implying it, aren't I? Um, but substantively, though, um, the philosophical uh, power that allows us to do that and that I drew heavily upon in the context of that speech was simply the substance of the nonviolent philosophy, as I understand it, as articulated by Martin Luther King Jr. and represented by other folks, uh, of course, as well in that movement prior to and subsequently. And um, for me, well, and according to the substance of that philosophy, it begins with a a priori recognition of the fact that regardless of how wrong or how corrupt or how in error your opposition may be, there is still an essential human dignity which presupposes a conscience that might be spoken to in the context of social interaction that if we are in a, if we if we are able to discipline ourselves sufficiently enough to be able to recognize and to speak to with the voice of of ultimately humility forgiveness and love that we be able to see this human dignity and recognize the fact that there is an anchor of reason that can ultimately that can ultimately be reached at least in very many cases then we maximally empower ourselves to be able to absorb whatever it is the opposition is not only saying but doing to us and to speak to them in a way that allows them to progressively open their eyes to the genuine moral force and substance of what it is we are saying because ultimately there is a conviction baked into this philosophy that says that what the human spirit most wants um, is to be able to find connection um, with other human beings. And so this is to acknowledge what I think I may have mentioned up top, the fact that, and I was speaking on the macro level earlier in our conversation, we have these two poles in human nature. And in our politics, you see that there's a drive to sort of tear everything down because we're mad at the other side, right? Or at the very least, we are heedless of the consequences of the way we fight with each other because all we care about is the fight. But then there's another aspect of human nature which isn't always as conspicuous, but which over the long run is more powerful and more enduring. And that is the desire to embody the embody virtue as a means of allowing us to set aside our proximal anger and self-interest in order to pursue a longer term, but more important, ultimately more personally satisfying objective of, of, connecting with other human beings on the level of our shared humanity and building our social infrastructure from there. Okay, okay. So, let, me, let me ask you a question about that. Yeah. Uh, because as I was listening to you, you know, humility, forgiveness, love. Yeah. I was thinking that the sphere for this very powerful and deeply spiritual orientation is the personal and the private. So, for example, the marriage Right. You know, couples fight about money, about the kids, about whatever. 
Right. But they mustn't, must we not acknowledge, they, we, we couples mustn't fight in such a way as to destroy the relationship that we have. It's not to see the humanity of the person on the other side. That's it's right. to not to be humble and aware of our own fragility and fallibility. It's not to be forgiving when hurtful things have been said to us rather than nurturing the hurt. It's not to be loving uh, and you've got all your different definitions of love, but something like wanting to see the development and the growth of the human, human potential of the other person, yeah. uh, even above your own comfort and convenience, you know, might not be a bad definition and all of that. And that, that's for the marriage. That's for how I do with my children. That, that's, that's, et cetera. Mm. Private. I'm not sure that the same spiritual um, instincts translate effectively they do so rhetorically, but I'm not sure they actually do so effectively, philosophically effectively, I mm-hmm. mean, uh, into the public realm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the nature of my relationship to my fellow citizen is not the same as the nature of my relationship to my son or to my wife. And the, and the notion of love there can't possibly mean mm-hmm. the same thing, can it? Mm-hmm. Uh, when I talk about a stranger uh, with whom I share, you know, the uh, public uh, connections of a civil a society or whatever, but with whom I don't share intimacy. Hmm. So can you speak to that? Because it feels like you might be playing with words a little bit, moving without justification mm-hmm. from the uh, spiritual principles relevant to, uh, pros- you know, to having a healthy uh, private uh, life to those uh, of how it is that we deal with each other in public. Well, I think that you would agree that some things can be, can be, different in terms, some phenomena can be different in terms of, of magnitude, but nevertheless share a similarity in terms of, in terms of parallel. So in other words, it's true, of course, that you're never going to love a random stranger, much less a person whose political and social orientation and behavior uh, marks them as being diametrically opposed to your own social and political interests and values as you will love your child who is somebody whom you're going to orient your entire life and your entire being around their, their welfare. And I have kids and I understand this viscerally well. Yeah. On the other hand, it is true that just as you share a deep and intimate connection with your child or with your spouse, maybe more useful analogy here. Um, actually we can take both just as you share a, 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 a deep and intimate relationship with your child and your spouse upon whom your central welfare depends ultimately, uh, certainly emotionally and perhaps materially as well, the process of a marital partnership and so forth. So too do you share a certain connection with that stranger and with that uh, stranger's child in so much as your albeit broadly distributed and indirect relationship with that stranger, particularly within the context of a political union, uh, the integrity of that relationship still has very real implications for our ability to be able to operate a societal system in a way that accrues to the benefit of you and your wife and your child. And your relationship to that stranger's child has particular implications for the relationship that will exist within that political union between your child and that stranger's child in the future. And so the social trajectory that we want to put ourselves on is one that establishes a moral center of gravity that even if it doesn't, and it rarely does, accomplish a wholesale transformation in our social attitudes towards one another overnight, sends us upon this long moral arc that ultimately bends towards justice in Dr. King's terminology that puts us on a pathway towards greater and greater consolidation of the social unity of the broadly distributed parts of the political union over the course of time so as to solidify the integrity of that political union, um, well, um, over, over, over the long haul, just to reiterate it. And that is something that happens by force of cultural gravity. And therefore, that cultural gravity needs to itself be a reflection of a moral gravity. That is something that is, that is cultivated by and illumin- that is cultivated deliberately um, in the ways in which we choose to think about each other, to interact with one another, uh, to talk about one another, and to relate. Uh, with with one another, um, because 
ultimately, the, the reason these things are parallel, the, 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 the macro political social relationships and the, and the small nuclear familial relationships is because the same fundamental questions present themselves to us in each different context. I feel a certain way about people in my country. I feel a certain way about people in my family. And it might be that I'm morally pissed off at all of them. And you know as well as I do, that happens in families with devastating consequences, just as it happens in nations. But the question is, and the question is, yes, it, it, it is easier for it to seem more salient in a familial context because the positive bonds are so deep and so obvious as well. But the question still becomes, you know, am I going to regulate my own internal behavior and attitudes towards the people in my family who I disagree with, but who I nevertheless love, right? Is love going to motivate me to modify my own behavior and thoughts and to even be willing to accept the fact that maybe my wife or, or maybe my son <clears throat> or maybe my father is never going to change in certain ways or will never change as quickly as I might want that person to. But because the relationship is so important, because the union is so important, am I going to make the choice uh, yeah. to be humble and to endure those differences for the sake of making this better and better and better and better over time. Well, that fundamental question that presents itself to us in a familial context is just as evident in a broad okay. social political context. In okay, okay. Let, let, let me, because I think we might be running out of time here for this particular session. And I like this uh, note that we're on right now about humility, forgiveness, and love as being a formula for uh, bridging uh, divides, even uh, partisan racial divides. Mm. Uh, and I thought of a couple of things. So I was thinking about reparations. Yeah. So this is an issue that could come up uh, even in the presidential election. It has been in the press and they've been writing about it and talking about it. And a, and a radical idea hit me as I was listening to humility, forgiveness, and love. What about black people forgiving America for the fact of slavery? Ah, I said it. <laughs> I mean, and I'm and I'm, I'm intentionally being provocative. Okay, I'm taking maybe it's a reductio ad absurdum. I don't know. I'm taking you seriously. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. Indeed. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Is there anything in the idea? Uh, or pr- let me not be so provocative. Forgive for slavery. Oh my God. How about forgiving the white cop who, in the heat of a horrible situation, discharges his weapon and kills a black kid? Mm-hmm. Right. How about forgiving that guy? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how about me too? How about some of these uh, miscreants? Okay, mm-hmm. who have stepped over some line, and the names are n- numerous. And I'm not talking about Harvey Weinstein. Put him under the jail, or Jeffrey Epstein. May he mm-hmm. rest in peace. But I mean, there are a lot of people whose lives have been destroyed because of relatively minor transgressions, which are in a witch hunt environment. People are unforgiving about. How about forgiveness there? Or right. um, or uh, what about crime? I mean, put it on the other side. What about the person who commits a crime? We got we got a system where the jails are overflowing in this country. We got longer sentences than any other country in the West for stuff. We got a, a, we got more people per capita in prison for life without the possibility of parole than right. Sweden has in prison for anything for mm-hmm. any length of time. Right. How about forgiveness there? We're going to be talking. About so you see what I'm saying? Let's, I do. If we take it I seriously, do. we move out of the realm of, of uh, process, mm-hmm. how we talk, and into the realm of what we do. Right, right. These, these are the uncomfortable statements that suggest to me that you are on the right track. With <laughs> how it is you're thinking about this? Because, no, you're right. By the way, did you see Marion Williamson? Uh, I love Marion Williamson. I, I don't know what you're referring to me having seen. I've seen her in the debates, and I saw her interview yeah. once or did twice. You see her, did you see her in the church, in that church? I did not see yeah. her in a church. Okay, I'll tell you what she did. She was in a church that had black people and white people in it. And she took, she, she, she you know, she, she's a preacher and she was preaching, but, but at a certain point, she, and she's walking through the, <clears throat> through the pews and she says, I have something to, to ask of all the white people in this church. And she has them all stand up, all the white people. And she says, I want you, she says, bow your hand, close your eyes, whatever she says. She says, I want you, I want you to do this. I want you to ask forgiveness um, of all the black people in this church, the crime of slavery, 
<laughs> and for the crime of you know Jim Crow and this, that, and the other, and just sort of calls out, summons the white people to repentance, you know, having them verbally articulate their you know their uh <laughs> their 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 shame and to and to repent before before the black folks who are also i guess sort of sitting and standing and some are just kind of like oh, i guess i'll take this you know and uh now i don't know what i think about that particular approach because some white people were really into it and just like oh white guilt let me jump right into it and other white people were clearly like i don't know how i feel about this and the reason i mentioned that anecdote is because I, I appreciate where Marianne is coming from, but when it comes to forgiveness, it is our it is a it is every bit the vital moral imperative that we arrive at this point of being able to offer forgiveness in all directions, right? Without necessarily suggesting all offenses are e equal, but that all offenses nevertheless necessitate forgiveness to be able to be transcended in a social context which requires the equal the equal benevolence of each party towards the other, right? But it's, so the question is, how do we go about doing that? And I would not be likely to get up a, at a podium and say, black people, you need to forgive America, or white people, you need to, or, you know, Trump supporters, you need to forgive uh, everybody who, you know, tried to impeach our president or whatnot. My, my approach, however, is to make plain the fact that, look, forgiveness is necessary. You may not want to do it, um, but when you come to recognize the fact that we're not able to hang together as a human family, much less an American family, or as just a nuclear family, without this being a deeply embedded and nurtured part of our value structure, then we're never going to be able to proceed socially. But beyond that, Forgiveness is something that allows for the liberation of the pain that not only the other person feels, but that you yourself feel as a consequence of hating that person. And so we need to stir the natural motivation towards yeah. these impulses. And to me, that's the Christian that's the Christian path, ultimately, whether you believe in a more literal or figurative interpretation of who Christ was. Who Christ was was a person who demonstrated the efficacy of this way of being in in an ultimate sort of way. And I do look at that as the, as the moral endpoint of the type of people we ought to strive to be, even in the context of our politics. And so, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. Yeah, I've heard the Christian uh, uh, intonations of this uh, thing. And uh, Martin Luther King, I wonder, I, I don't know that we have time to pursue this right now, what do you think about uh, the, the legacy of King as a spiritual leader in the progressive uh, uh, social justice movements of our time, uh, mm. whether there's a whole lot of Martin Luther King in Black Lives Matter? And I don't mean that as a criticism. I'm just asking a question. You right. know, and, and it does seem to me that this uh, mm. opposition, which can be overdrawn between Malcolm X Stokely Carmichael, Black Power, uh, Raise Fist, uh, Defiance, uh, et cetera, on the one hand, and the path of love. I mean, Malcolm would have laughed at that. At least early Malcolm would have thought that was ludicrous, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and and um, yet the, uh, the legacy of King uh, has gone through various cycles. And I'm not talking about these most recent revelations about his private life and stuff like that. I'm, I'm just talking about, so I have a dream. You know, that used to be kind of a literal assertion of some kind of idealization of American possibility. And now it's only invoked in a kind of ironic, uh, almost dismissive cast of mind. You know, I mean, uh, I have a dream that my poor four little children will be judged by the content. That, you know, that's kind of corny. I mean, you, you know, no <laughs> serious person says that and expects to be taken seriously in saying it. Right. Um, so uh, and King's Christianity. You know, that movement, that movement, uh, a pacifism, a Bayard Rustin. And wasn't he a Quaker? Wasn't he a, you know, a, a open to Eastern religious influence and stuff like that? I think he was uh, bringing the king to that philosophy. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's kind of you don't hear that anymore. And I don't know what I'm not. Again, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not criticizing or wagging a finger. I'm just saying it's an interesting thing to observe. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is a subject that we could easily take another hour on. Um, mm -hmm. 
But I, I would say that, uh, do you know Hawk Newsom? Are you familiar with him? He's the leader of Black Lives Matter in New York. You might have noticed that occasion where uh, some Black Lives Matter uh, protesters showed up at a, uh, at a Trump rally. And uh, the organizers of the rally actually did an unexpected thing, and they invited the Black Lives Matter activists up on stage to have a couple of minutes to speak to the audience. And the leader of that Black Lives Matter group, Hawk Newsom, took the microphone and started his remarks. Uh, and in his in his telling, he was going to say something to kind of, you know, take off the folks and to really go to bat, really battle with them. But then he he thought about it. And he's a Christian and he, he sort of said an internal prayer. And, and God said something to him along the lines of let them see who you are. And. Um, and he started his remarks by saying something along the lines of, and I'm going to get it somewhat wrong, but the spirit of it was, you know, um, I am I am a black man. Um, I am an American. And I am here uh, because I believe um, in freedom. And uh, and he spoke to and he spoke to the religious and kind of civic sentiments of many of the people in opposition to him in the audience, um, making the point that he was there for justice and, and that, you know, that, and that um, I don't want to do a disservice to the exact substance mm -hmm. of it, but he made it clear that they shared a God and they shared a country in common and that he believed that they ought to love one another, even as he wasn't going to give an inch in opposing police brutality and the racism that he felt had been destroying what America was, was really about. And he made the point that the reason black lives matter is what they say is not because all lives don't matter. All lives will never matter, he said, until black lives do matter. Because when a black man gets killed in America, nobody blinks an eye. But he made it clear that he was not saying that their lives did not matter, but, mo but merely that black lives do. And so I've gotten to know Hawk a little bit. He was a speaker at our uh, at our convention, he had a wonderful conversation. That is a Better Angels convention. He had a wonderful, wonderful conversation with uh, the leader of the Tea Party in in Cincinnati. Hawk is a, is a good case study for this because I got to ask you this. I, I know we're running long. I, excuse me for interrupting, man. But well, no, let me just make the point because I'm, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing your question. Hawk has been pilloried by members of Black Lives Matter for being as uh, for extending the olive branch that he has I see. To, to folks, you know, on, on the right, to Trump supporters and, you know, maybe just white folks uh, more broadly speaking. And Hawk himself, his speech is not always seasoned with grace. I see him on Facebook and he says some things that make me think like, ah, come on, Hawk. <laughs> take it a step backwards with, with, with that one, you know. But he also has this feeling that part of what they need to do Black Lives Matter. And what we need to do is not totally lose touch with the moral force of King's argument and this idea of Christian love as a means by which we can reforge social bonds. So there are people within Black Lives Matter, um, I can say firsthand, who don't want to totally lose touch with this. But there's a broader phenomenon, I think, in just left wing activism in, in general, right wing activism, a whole nother thing. Um, wherein the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. has come to seem politically or, or at least has come to seem irrelevant with respect to the substance of King's actual philosophy. He is maintained as a symbol of black excellence and the pursuit for justice, both racial and economic even. You find that King the Socialist is much more emphasized now in certain areas than he may have been in the past. And how accurate a characterization that is is another question. But um, there is a deep discomfort among many with the reconciliatory tone of nonviolence uh, as Dr. King represented it. And the reassertion of the substance of that philosophy on the left, as well as America broadly, is something I very much hope for, but we still have to say for another conversation, I imagine. Now, I don't see how uh, the philosophy of better angels, as I understand it, and more broadly, not just the organization but the conciliation as the goal and the, the sense of recognizing the humanity of the other, uh, of, you, you know, humility, forgiveness, and love. I don't see how that doesn't in the end militate toward a transracial sensibility, mm. toward, toward a recognition that the white and the blackness of it is really not very important. I mean, it may be conditionally important in a given historical situation, 
that it helps to explain the nature of that situation, but it can't be bedrock morally important. If, if indeed I'm arguing for a kind of brotherhood and a, and a sense of love uh, in the, in the uh, polity, uh, we, are, we, we worship the same God, we, we uh, love the same country kind of thing like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't see how at the end, I mean, we may not make that the first point or the second point we want to make mm-hmm. because we know people are dug in and we have to work with people. But I don't see how it can't be that the goal is that it doesn't have to be Black Lives Matter. It has to be all lives matter. It may be that it's Black Lives Matter right now for good and, sp- and serious historical reason, but it can't be like we stuck there. Uh, because after all, the cops are killing more white than there are black people in this country. If, if, you know, the cops are off the hook. That's a human issue, man. The, the, holding the cops accountable for the use of deadly force, that, that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. In the same spirit, as I would want to say, if I saw a higher crime rate amongst African Americans, higher homicide rate, a higher burglary and robbery rate, or higher offending at this or that uh, law, uh, yeah, there are black people who are offending. You can't, like, ignore the fact that they're offending, or really, if you're a police officer, you can't really ignore the fact that they're black. But you can't rest there. That can't be your... That's got to be just the fact that you have to overcome, not something that you dig in around. Yeah. And likewise here. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm unconvinced by uh, the young man that you're talking about, although I'm glad to know that he exists and is, is uh, exhibiting the uh, spiritual qualities that you described. Well, look, Hawk is, Hawk is terrific because, you know, Hawk is a person who's willing to, to build that bridge, even as he and even as I and even as you and others, you know, make all manner of mistakes, perhaps, in, in approaching this type of project. Um, but no, I do agree with your with your um, with your assertion about the implication of Better Angels philosophy. I, I do think it tends us towards a deeper and more genuine integration, and obviously that has you know that intones this idea of racial integration, which I think is a consequence more and more of that type of thinking. And you know, by the way, if a person was not a racial integrationist, that person's voice would still be one we would very much want to have come into the types of uh, conversations that we're fostering in Better Angels, precisely because the, the, the point of our structures is to facilitate a constructive interaction of social energies that are going to find ways to express themselves anyway, right? And that's part yeah. of the freedom of speech and the civic process and so forth. But I do think that, um, you know, thing about integration, particularly in the way that Dr. King understood it, was that it was more than just kind of meeting a diversity quota where you, where you have a certain number of lighter and darker skinned people in the room, or maybe people of different genders or orientations or whatnot. But it had more to do with a the fostering of a real culture of, of interpersonal of the, uh, it had more to do with the fostering of a culture of based on the recognition of the vileness of one another and the genuine human dignity that exists across all of these different lines that once recognized, once recognized allows us to see ourselves in one another and to thereby more effectively be able to love one another as we love ourselves. That is the essence of integration in the Kenyan worldview, as opposed to desegregation, which is a technical matter where you remove the prohibitive structures that keep us from being able to occupy the same space. But integration was a matter of social spiritual transformation. And I do think that, uh, in in Dr. King's view, uh, Reverend... Well, I mean, let's play it out, because the the ultimate implication of that is intermarriage. It is is a, a blending in the intimate sphere as well as in the civil sphere and in, in some sense it, it is the end of, of blackness uh, that, well, gets, that gets pretty radical but I think that's I think that's where the arrow is pointing I mean so look uh, <laughs> in, in the same sense that there's been an end of Irishness I mean in the same sense that there's been the end of Jewishness I mean that that puts it very starkly but, the, but assimilation intermarriage is an inexorable force if you if you really embrace these values 
See, See, I have I have long po- social and theological directions that I can go with what you've just said, and I don't think I'm going to be able to do it justice at the okay. moment. Okay, so we have to have another conversation. But we got, we got to pick up on that same thread, though. The end of blackness. We, I'm, I'm happy to go down that road. We oh yeah, funny well, to say on that subject that probably surprised some folks. And okay, you know, um, so that'll so, be our next conversation. I want everybody to know this is John Wood that he's a director of uh, media relations at uh, media development, I should say, at Better Angels, uh, and uh, my friend. And uh, we've just enjoyed a conversation here at the Glenn Show. So thanks for listening. Indeed. Appreciate it, Glenn.